Coming up on Doctype, landing pages, conversion funnels, and Facebook Oh My! We'll show you how to create some totally rad landing pages. Then, have you ever heard of a closure? Well, neither have I. We're going to learn how to use JavaScript closures to make the most out of your code. So put on your sombrero and cancel all your plans, because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by the Front End Design Conference and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that doesn't know the difference between JavaScript and a decaf latte, or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the internet. All right, so this week a pretty cool tech demo of HTML5 got posted. Yeah, so it was over at craftymind.com. It was a couple of demos using HTML5 in combination with a canvas to create some pretty cool effects. Uh, one of them is they took the video and sort of sliced it into rectangles and played it so it looked like one big gigantic rectangle until you click it and those little other rectangles just sort of exploded around scattering while still playing the video like they would be. So it was a bunch of little videos composed to make a big one. So it was a really cool demo of what you can use, how you can use Canvas and JavaScript to really apply some cool effects. And there was another one with like a 3D screen rotating in space. So a lot of cool tech demos. It's, it's, you got to sort of remember that now HTML5 video is part of your page so you can really interact with it with JavaScript and the DOM elements in your page. Definitely. Very cool. Well, this week I'm going to be talking about landing pages and Jim is going to be talking about closures in JavaScript. Let's take a look. A landing page is a special web page that's focused on a particular goal. Maybe you're trying to direct users towards a sign-up form, or maybe you're trying to persuade them of a political movement, or perhaps you're creating an interactive experience for a video game or a movie. Whatever it is, you need to make sure that you have a clear goal from the start because it will help guide the rest of your decision making. Once you have a goal in mind, you'll want to think about the overall user experience. Where are your visitors coming from, and where do they end up? So for example, if you're selling a product or service for a major brand, you might have several advertising campaigns via outlets like direct mail, television, online ads, and social marketing that direct visitors to your landing page. But after they've seen your landing page, where do you want them to end up? Traditionally, the end goal is to sell a product or get users to sign up for something, and you'll hear the term conversion funnel thrown around a lot. I feel like this term is starting to become a bit dated, however, because oftentimes the user experience doesn't resemble a funnel at all. For example, in the case of Doctype, New viewers usually hear about us via word of mouth, bookmarking sites, social networks, and several other sources. Then, they typically end up on our website and maybe watch a few episodes. Finally, they'll often visit our Facebook fan page or start following us on Twitter so that they can participate in community discussions, see additional content, and hear about new episodes. And the cycle continues. None of this is any good if you can't track it. Tracking offline sources can be difficult, but you can use tricks like special URLs and discount codes that you hand out to each individual medium. For tracking online sources, you can use tools like Google Analytics, Get Clicky, or anything else you decide you like. As you've just seen, the whole user experience is more than just skin deep. However, the aesthetics are still a very important component. When designing your landing pages, staying focused is the key. Right away, even without reading a single word, your visitors should be able to tell that they're in the right place. The colors, imagery, branding, and overall experience should feel very similar to where they came from, especially if they've heard about you via a very visual medium like a video ad spot, a banner ad, or a movie trailer. Next, the most prominent text on the page should tell your target audience where they are and what it is that they're looking at. This is usually just one sentence long, but it should be understandable by everyone, even if they're outside your target audience. Finally, you should have a prominent call to action. This usually comes in the form of a large clickable area that directs the user to the next step, whether they're watching the latest episode of Doctype, signing up for a newsletter, or purchasing a product. Facebook fan pages are fast becoming a very popular way to market brands, products, and organizations. The interesting thing about this phenomenon is that brands are skipping their web pages entirely and sending people directly to Facebook. The reason it's a great idea to direct people to Facebook is because when a visitor likes your page, you form a more long-term connection with them rather than the one-time visit that other types of landing pages can generate. You can also see more information about the demographics so you know if your campaign is hitting the right target audience. 
Additionally, you can leverage all the social aspects of Facebook. Sometimes a brand will have a default landing page using FBML, but I recommend using the wall as a landing page instead so that you put the focus on the community. There's a lot more to learn about landing pages and Facebook fan pages, so I'm sure we'll be revisiting this in a future episode. When we come back, Jim is going to show you JavaScript closures. If you're a web person, you're going to want to check out the Front End Design Conference. It's a one-day design conference in beautiful St. Petersburg, Florida on July 22nd. There are seven amazing speakers that will be covering a wide range of front-end design topics. There's even a cool after-party and a whole weekend of mad geekery. Jim and I attended last year, and it was a blast. Head on over to frontendconf.com and get your ticket. Early bird tickets are just $99 and only $129 later on. We hope to see you at the Front End Design Conference. You may have heard of closures in regard to JavaScript. Now, they can be confusing to begin with, but understanding what closures are and how they work will allow you to write really powerful JavaScript. Closures have to do with the way variables are managed inside of JavaScript. It also has to do with how functions can be defined inside of other functions. Let's take a look at a simple example. Here we have created a function called say hello, and inside of it, it defines a variable called person. It then creates an alert with a greeting using the person variable. When we actually call the function say hello, JavaScript creates a variable with the name person and the value Joe Smith, and it makes this variable accessible from within the say hello function. When our call to say hello completes, and we return back to the global scope, we no longer have any way to access the person variable, since it's only visible from inside the say hello function. Since JavaScript JavaScript knows that we can no longer access the person variable, it removes it from the system to save memory. This is known as garbage collection. If there were no garbage collection, we would just take up more and more memory, remembering variables that we no longer need. Bugs or errors in the garbage collection are known as memory leaks, since they use more and more system memory. Now let's look at a similar example, but use JavaScript's ability to define functions inside of functions. Here, we have a function that is called hello builder, and inside it creates a person variable, and a say hello function, which we will then return. Inside of our inner say hello function, we can use the person variable that is defined in the outer hello builder function. When we call hello builder, JavaScript creates the person variable, creates a say hello function, and then it will return it. You might think that when hello builder finishes and we go back to the global namespace, that we can delete the person variable because we can no longer access it, but we can't. We returned a function from the hello builder scope that can access the person variable. If person was garbage collected, calling our say hello function wouldn't work because there would be no person to greet. What happened is when we created our inner say hello function, JavaScript looked at all the variables that say hello can see and said, don't garbage collect these, I might need to use them later. We say that the say hello function closed around the person variable or created a closure. As long as our inner function is still accessible in the system, all of the variables it can reach are kept safe. Closures are most often used when attaching event listeners to elements. It can also create some confusing errors, and here's the most common one. Here, we gather all the div tags on our page and attach a click listener that will alert which number that div is in the order of the page. We use a normal for loop to go through each div in our array and assign a click listener to it. Inside of the click listener, we'll use the variable i from the for loop to indicate which div it is. So when we click the first div on our page, we want it to say I am div number zero, and the second to say I am div number one, etc. What actually happens is no matter which div we click, we get the same number, which will be the total number of divs on the page. Now why is this? When we refer to i in our individual onClick functions, we are actually referring to the i variable itself, not its current value in the loop. By the time we actually click our divs, the i variable has been incremented to the total number of divs, so that's what's going to be displayed. To fix this, we actually do something a little tricky. We wrap the inside of our for loop with a function and immediately call it. We let our new function take exactly one argument, which will be the number of the current div. When we call our new function, we pass it i from the for loop, and the current value of i will be assigned to the number argument inside of our function. We can then assign our event listener and refer to number instead of i. This will work because we have created a new separate closure for each of our divs, so they won't interact with each other like they did before. And that's the basic idea behind closures. The concept of closures is so important to JavaScript that understanding how they work and how to use them effectively will make you a much better JavaScript programmer.
Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you gonna go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So, we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you gonna use? Enter the code DOCTYPE3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that's all for this week until next time be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype tv on twitter and if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of doctype send us an email at questions at doctype.tv and if you subscribe by itunes or rss you'll never miss an episode of doctype so until next tuesday remember that every great web page starts with doctype <laughs>